I will try and shout, but please, if you can't hear me in the back, please let me know. Um, this is a very difficult topic to explain, and I, I regret somewhat suggesting it, but I think it's really important and interesting. So what I'm going to try and explain to you today, ultimately, is, is, is what the, the bodies, uh, what happens with our bodies that causes autoimmune diseases. Um, but in order to understand that, I have to explain to you the immune system. And this is something you, we didn't even really understand when I was at school, and it's now taught mostly at university level. But I will try and give you a kind of overview that gives you an idea of what our immune system is supposed to do. And in the second part of the talk, I'm going to start talking about some of the diseases that I look after in my practice here as a doctor. Principally, I'm going to talk about rheumatoid arthritis. I will mention briefly lupus and some other conditions. But I would say that for people who are interested in related autoimmune diseases, we definitely feel that the more we can understand about one, that will help us understand the others. And then I'll just finish off by telling you what, what the treatments are at the moment that are directed at the immune system and really what the prospects are for the future and how we're researching to try and help that. So what is our immune system? And um, our immune system is the parts of our body that are designed to protect us against particularly infections and cancers. And it's, we can split it up into the organ level and then the cell level getting smaller and smaller. And I'm going to show you some pictures of the cells that are involved. But also we can now understand the immune system at the mo molecular level and I'm going to introduce you to what antibodies are, because they're important in many autoimmune diseases. And I'm also going to introduce you to a group of proteins called cytokines, one of which is called TNF. And that's very important because we now use treatments against TNF in, in a whole variety of diseases. So I hope you can see the picture. But... Um, when we think of the immune system, it's not like our heart. It's not just one organ. It actually turns out to have quite a number of organs. Our immune cells start off from our bone marrow, which, if you can see, is down in this lady's leg. That's, there's bone marrow inside our femur bone. Then some of the, bone, the immune cells travel up to a gland called the thymus, or, which many of us don't even know we've got, which hides up here behind our heart. And then the cells of the immune system travel around the body. So the lymph nodes and the spleen and the tonsils are all organs of our immune system. And I'll show you, talk about that later. I like to think of the immune system as um, a bit like a police force. And we have an, uh, what we call an innate or a primitive immune system, which is a bit like... Um, dogs. Now, I'm not a dog owner, and I'll, I'll have to ask some dog owners for help later on. But the dogs are very good at barking if they find there's an intruder coming. They're much better than us. So uh, we need our, our immune system, our dogs, to recognise if an infection is attacking us. But you also need what we call the adaptive immune system. You need an intelligent immune system. And um, uh, the analogy I'm going to draw is with the police force. And I'll tell you why we need them later as well. So the idea of the dogs is they're very good at barking if there's an infection or a cancer. The other thing they're very good at doing is uh, attacking things that they don't like or they're told to attack. But of course, occasionally the dogs can get it wrong and they can start biting people they're not supposed to. And essentially that's part of what autoimmune disease is, as I will go on to show you. Whereas the police force are much, much cleverer. They can actually look up their files, they can remember things, they can go and look for suspects. So we need both parts of our immune system. So how actually, what, who are the dogs and who are the policemen? And the dogs are, both of the cells, both types, are contained within our white blood cells. Now this is a highly magnified picture of what's inside your blood. And it's coloured red because our red blood cells are here. Almost as important, or just as important, within our blood, we have the white blood cells. And we have different kinds. I'm really going to talk about two or three kinds. The neutrophils and the monocytes are the dogs, and the lymphocytes are the policemen and women. Again, here are some 
fantastic pictures, which admittedly come from Google, but they are scientific <laughs> pictures. Uh, it's a wonderful source. So these are magnified thousands of times of these different kinds of white blood cells. And here's a neutrophil, here's a macrophage, and here is a white blood cell magnified even more. So what are these cells doing? Well, here's a neutrophil, and it's actually, in this picture, it's actually killing these little white things, our bacteria. This is what it's supposed to do. If we get an infection, we need our neutrophils to kill bacteria. <coughs> what are the lymphocytes? Here's a lymphocyte at high power. We actually have two kinds of lymphocytes. We have many more, but two main kinds called B and T. And um, I'm going to, for the purposes of today's talk, the T's are going to be the women, the policewomen, and the B cells are going to be the policemen. Now, I'm interested in T cells, and they are the actual cells that totally control everything. So you can <laughs> ascribe what you will to that. <laughs> also, the T cells, they, all these cells start out in our bone marrow, which I would kind of regard as a sort of uh, sixth form or high school. But then um, the T cells go on to a police academy, which is in our thymus gland. The B cells never get that far. They're not quite as sophisticated. <laughs> and as I said, these T cells, they go to the thymus because they need this academy because they need to decide whether the thing that they're recognising is ourself or something foreign. And that's actually a really difficult target. So if the thymus is the police academy, once they're trained up, these policewomen then circulate around the community, they go to the local police stations. So our lymph nodes would be a local police station. And when you feel your lymph nodes are swollen, they're swelling up because they're filling up with lots of policewomen and dogs all coming to try and solve, <laughs> solve whatever crime's gone on. So if you've got a sore throat, they tend to come to your neck because that's near the action. The B cells um, don't actually go to the thymus, but they are actually important for making antibody-producing cells. So they're the ones that develop and make antibodies, which I'm going to tell you about later. But we need both our B and our T cells. So here are some amazing facts about our immune system. The one thing that I always thought was most amazing is that they are designed to recognise things we have never, ever seen. So um, when things like SARS or AIDS or Ebola came out, None of us have seen those, and obviously they're not great examples because our immune systems have struggled with some of those diseases. But actually, we do have immune cells that can recognise SARS, AIDS, Ebola, and yet we've never seen it. So how does that happen? And one of the ways we now know is we have tens, even hundreds of millions of different little policewomen, little lymphocytes, policewomen and men, circulating around our body, and they all recognise different things. That's the first amazing fact. Millions of them, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> and that raises the question then, how does our immune system actually distinguish, because this is the key point of the talk, between what's our own body, what's our own self, and what is foreign? And we've now come a great deal towards understanding that. And basically what it is, is that our immune system is supposed to be tolerant of ourself. And one of the main reasons we're tolerant is these T cells, the policewomen that go to the police academy, our body actually shows them all our own proteins while they're there. And if they recognise self, if they want to attack the self, our body actually kills them off. So it's almost like the rowdy, dangerous policewomen just get thrown out of the police academy. <coughs> and the ones that are left are actually not, they're specifically screened so they don't recognise our own self proteins. But they recognise all sorts of other things, ones, things we've never even come across. And that means when we do get an infection or a cancer, there should be some cells in our body which are specifically able to recognise them. But each of these police women and men can only recognise a few of these bad things and they require a lot of multiplication to actually develop our immune response. So how do we actually recognise and get rid of foreign things? And how does that go wrong? Well, antibodies are very important. And these are some pictures of different kinds of antibodies. We actually have lots in our body. But essentially what's important about the antibody is that it has a, 
a special receptor that is specific for what we call an antigen, which is a small particle. Now, most antigens <coughs> are things like pertussis toxin or vaccines and things like that, or bugs or infections. But occasionally, and that's what our immune system is supposed to do, and usually it does it quite well. But occasionally, these antibodies come to recognise ourself, and that's when we call them an autoantibody. So auto just means self. And in a number of diseases, and I'll come on to describe a few, we both find these autoantibodies, i.e. antibodies that are directed against ourself, and sometimes we think they may be causing disease, although that's turned out to be a complicated story. I will come back to these antibodies later, or if I don't, remind me in the questions. And I wanted to introduce you also to these other proteins and to this protein called tumor necrosis factor, or TNF, which is what we call a cytokine. And cytokines are hormones of our immune system. This is TNF multiplied several million times. And um, this is where I was struggling to think of the analogy. Are, are there any dog owners here? There must be some. What, what excites and drives your dog mad, wild, gets it excited? <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking of cat catnip for cats, but I haven't, there are no cats in this talk. So something like um, essence of bone marrow <laughs> is what this does. So it's, it's a sort of thing that excites the dogs, gets the dogs going. And it's actually good if you've got an infection, you want those dogs to come. But if you develop rheumatoid arthritis, your cells, as I'll show you, are producing too much of this. The dogs are all excited, and th instead of attacking a foreign thing, they attack our own thing. So TNF, tumor necrosis factor, is, very imp is important in inviting infections, but if we have too much or have it in the wrong place, that makes us sick. And this, is, this understanding has helped important treatments which we now use, and I'll come on to in the last part of the talk. Good. So for the second part, I wanted to give some examples of diseases where we develop autoimmunity or too much immune, too big an immune response and an immune response against our, our own bodies. And rheumatoid arthritis is the disease I'm mostly going to talk about, and we've got stuff from the front from NRAS. And the reason for this is, it, firstly, it's common. There's at least 6,000 people with RA, as I'm going to call it, in Oxfordshire. It's the second commonest form of arthritis, and it is an arthritis which is characterised by inflammation. And inf by inflammation, it's a medical word meaning, um, in fact, I'll show you what it means in a second. The other thing we find in rheumatoid arthritis is evidence of autoimmunity, which are antibodies against ourselves, and I'll tell you a bit about those. So this is what happens early on in rheumatoid arthritis. The joints, often the small joints, usually the small joints of the hands, become swollen, inflamed, and very painful. As the disease progresses, the joints become more and more damaged. And I know there are many people in the room with RA. Suffice it to say, it can affect any joint with a synovial lining. It can also affect other parts of the body as well. And it is a serious disease um, with significant um, suffering and an increased, increased risk of dying. So what's going on in rheumatoid arthritis? On the left is a normal joint, uh, say a knee joint. And our normal joints have bones. And then in between the bones, we have a cartilage lining, which is like a shock absorber. And then we have a nice thin layer of cells called the synovium. And this makes the lubricants... Um, proteins to keep the joint mobile and allow us to, move, to walk around and move all our joints around. In rheumatoid arthritis, this synovium, the lining of the joint, becomes hugely thickened. This is showing it in a cartoon form. And this thickened synovium not only hurts, not only is it swollen, but it damages and destroys the joint and the bones over time. So what's going on inside that? Um, well, firstly, we know that in rheumatoid arthritis you get chronic inflammation. I'm going to show you on the next slide. You get destruction of the joints. They're damaged often irreversibly. And you have this autoimmunity going on, which I'm going to show you about as well. Okay, here we are. 
If you look down a microscope at one of these rheumatoid joints, instead of one single line of cells, we've got hundreds and hundreds. And these are mostly dogs. So these are the macrophages, the white blood cells I, and neutrophils I showed you earlier, but lymphocytes as well. So there's policemen, policewomen, dogs of all descriptions. And they've all come into this joint and they're tending to stay there and they really shouldn't be there. And the dogs are excited. They're biting the sides of the joints. This is what we call synovitis. And we've now realised if we don't get rid of this, the joints will, will be destroyed over time. And most of our treatments now, as I'll show you in the last part of the talk, are designed at getting rid of this synovitis or reducing the amount of inflammation. What we can't do yet, and this will be the kind of last message of my talk, is actually try and stop it happening in the first place or get rid of it completely. And we think that the reason it's so hard to treat is because the body is attacking itself. And if, as I told you earlier, our immune system, once the dogs and the policewomen and the policemen have decided to get rid of something, they will go on doing it. And of course, if that's an infection, usually they win in the end and get rid of the infection. But if it's our own body, our own body is, is never, you know, we can't get rid of our own body, so the, the inflammation continues. But what we don't know is what really triggers it. One of the things we find early on in the disease are antibodies, those proteins I showed you earlier, which start to recognise our own proteins. A lot of people talk about being positive, uh, seropositive or negative for the rheumatoid arthritis. By that we mean they have these things called rheumatoid factors, which 85% of RA patients have. And rheumatoid factors are antibodies that are specific for our own antibodies, so they kind of turn around and attack themselves. In the last 10 years or so, we've now found a new kind of antibody which we think is slightly more sensitive and specific for disease because you can have RA without these rheumatoid factors. And these are called CCP or ACPA antibodies. And they are antibodies to proteins and peptides that are citrullinated. And as I said, this is quite a new discovery and it really has been very useful both for diagnosis and for our understanding of disease. I can't remember if I'm going to tell you about... <coughs> I'll tell you about the citrullination in a minute. And these antibodies occur early in disease and some studies have shown that they actually can predate the disease and I know of at least one research study which is trying to <coughs> treat people even before they get RA if they've got these antibodies present. That's not our current practice but we do know that if you have these antibodies you are at increased risk but it's not 100% sure. Similarly if you were listening I said not all the patients have with RA have these antibodies. So that suggests either there are two kinds of RA or the antibodies aren't absolutely critical for the disease. And it could be that other mechanisms are driving disease. One of those could be actually the T cells, the policewomen, because we don't currently measure them. We only measure these antibodies made by the policemen. And the policewomen may be more important. So what do we think actually causes rheumatoid arthritis? We don't know and it's complicated, but we know that your genes do contribute maybe a quarter or a fifth of the risk. And huge big genetic studies, which in Oxford we've contributed to, but they now become multinational, have identified a lot of genes. And most of the genes identified are genes that control our immune response. So they make it more powerful, less powerful. They alter how the police men and women recognize things. We're also understanding that the environment is important. And interestingly, smoking has been found to be a trigger in quite a number of patients. And we think that that's this early on phase where the autoimmunity develops. And to give you an example with this citrullination, we know that, for example, smoking can stimulate our lungs <coughs> to make enzymes that change our own proteins by the citrullination, which is a modification of our own proteins. And the reason why we think this is, could be bad news is, of course, when our, our bodies are developing, 
we don't have these citrullinated proteins. It's only once we get exposed to smoking or pollution or whatever it is, then our own proteins can be changed. And that's why our immune system gets confused, because our immune system says, well, we've never seen this before, this citrullinated protein. And that seems to, in some people, trigger the T cells and the B cells both start attacking citrullinated proteins. It turns out we have lots of these citrullinated proteins in our joints, and that's why they seem to go to the joints. This theory isn't proven to be the cause of RA, but it does make a lot of sense. And at the moment, if I was betting on it, I would say that's our best prediction. <coughs> at the same time, we get these rheumatoid factors and, in fact, other immune responses to self-proteins. And then maybe something else needs to happen that actually finally pushes our immune system too far. And once that happens and the immune system starts attacking the joints, the damage to the joints, unfortunately, produces more of these proteins, and then our immune system thinks that those are foreign and attacks those in turn. Oh, here we are. So this citrullination, it's a very long word. As I said, our own natural proteins can be modified. Once they've been modified, they then appear foreign to our immune systems. And in rheumatoid arthritis, we now know that these immune responses, both T cells and antibodies, occur very early on in disease and maybe even predate disease. This does help us with our diagnosis. It doesn't prove that it's causing the disease. But ultimately, and I'll come back to this at the end, if we could find out the switch that starts the whole process, we could switch it off. At the moment, we use treatments that are not as sophisticated as that. And as I've told you, TNF, here it is again, we do know plays a major part in the symptoms and suffering of RA. And I'll come on to that as well in the last part of my talk. So in rheumatoid arthritis, we have these autoimmune responses to altered proteins. Here are a variety of other diseases which we would class as autoimmune diseases. So in the juvenile form of diabetes, we now recognize some of the autoantigens are actually proteins within our pancreas, the insulin secreting gland. And of course, once the immune system starts attacking that, it will destroy the pancreas and we don't make any insulin. In multiple sclerosis, there's evidence for pro important proteins in our brain becoming the targets of our immune system. Myasthenia gravis, it's where the muscles and nerves attach. In what we call autoimmune thyroiditis, which isn't the cause of all thyroiditis, it's actually parts of the thyroid gland that become the targets of the immune system. And in lupus, which I'm going to mention last, again, it's multiple organs that are affected. Again, lupus is a condition rheumatologists look after. It stands for systemic lupus erythematosus. And here, um, you get a whole variety of symptoms, not just in the joints, but skin rash, kidneys, blood problems. And here, the antibodies are to our own, our own genes, our own DNA. Again, this is something our body can't get rid of, so it tends to be a condition that at the moment we can't cure, we can only treat. And again, anything that damages our cells, such as sunlight, sunburn, infections, seems to trigger these immune responses to our own genes, our own DNA. And we think that's what's causing lupus. So then for the final 10 minutes of my talk, I wanted to talk about the treatments of rheumatoid arthritis at the moment and the research and where we're going in the future. So the mainstay of drug treatment of RA, and obviously many other types of treatment are important, have been painkillers, what we call non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, steroids, which are a very, very blunderbuss way of dampening down our immune system, drugs we call disease-modifying drugs, such as methotrexate, which we don't, in honesty, really know how they work. But one thing they do seem to do is just dampen down our policemen are, and women, the T cells. And then what we call biologics, which is what I'm going to talk about a little bit more. 
And these biologic treatments are complex protein drugs that require to be made in cells, which is why they're called biologics. And they're all pretty much targeting our immune systems. Now, the anti-TNF therapy, which I was going to talk about, um, this TNF protein has been known about from a variety of experiments in, in humans and mice for well over 30 years. But in the early 1990s, um, Professors Maney and Feldman, who were then working at the Kennedy Institute in London, um, were able to show with colleagues um, in joints of both mice with rheumatoid and then patients with rheumatoid, that in those inflamed joints, there was a, a large amount of this protein called TNF. And a, a company in the States had already made an antibody against the TNF, but they were the ones that said, please, and begged this company to give them the antibody to try on their patients. And those trials, which started in the 1990s, led to the use of anti-TNF antibody treatment. So this is an antibody directed against the TNF that actually is able to mop it up and take it out of our systems. A couple of things to say. The Kennedy <coughs> Institute has actually very, in the last couple of years, moved to Oxford. This is the new shiny building just across the road. And there's Princess Anne opening the Kennedy Institute last year. Um, the treatments, these anti-TNF treatments, are now certainly the number one drug in the whole world is adalumumab, which is one of these anti-TNF treatments, and I think there's three in the top ten. So these are huge, um, hugely important financially and also hugely important for patients. These are two brief clinical trials, um, and in this one, on the actually the one on the right was with infliximab, which was the original one that uh, Feldman and Maney used, showing that the patients in blue, or the, the, the patients who didn't have infliximab in blue, about 80% of them, their rheumatoid arthritis got worse over the period of the study in terms of damage on x-ray to their joints. Whereas the patients on infliximab, it was only 20%. And if you look at the patients that actually got better, it was zero without the treatment, and about 40% on infliximab. We now have at least five different types of anti-TNF treatment, and they all have about the same benefit in terms of how many people respond. The great thing about these drugs is that when they do work, they really make a big difference, and they often work very quickly. But only about 50 to 60% of people will respond to them. And we don't understand why some people do and some people don't. And that's something we, we want to research so we know who gets it. So these treatments have been amazing. So there's over a million patients with rheumatoid around the world who've had anti-TNF therapy. Um, in the Oxfordshire region, we have 1,000 patients that we're treating with anti-TNF or related biologics. I don't expect anyone to actually read this, but this is just to give you an idea <coughs> of how complicated all those different cells in the joints are all talking to each other, and they're all making different cytokines, so TNF is not the only one. Uh, in fact, I can't even see TNF in there. I can actually, there's one in, there's a bit in the middle. So, to some extent, it was an amazing good luck that just removing one of those components in such a, you know, a big battle, somehow managed to really, really reduce the amount of inflammation. So firstly, and there were other drugs tried which didn't work, but just taking one out seemed to help. But actually all these other ones are now becoming targets for other treatments. So we now have um, drugs such as tocilizumab, which takes out a different one of these cytokines, and that can also work. In fact, here are three more biologics that we regularly used to treat rheumatoid arthritis. This one removes the IL-6 signal. This one removes the police women. And this one re removes the police men. The problem with all these treatments, as with anti-TNF, is that we're taking a big chunk out of the immune system. 
we think the immune system, well, we know the immune system is far too active to start with, so we could argue whether we're bringing the immune system back to where it should be, but of course we are also perhaps in some cases reducing it, and that means it can't do its job against infections. So all of these drugs have a potential infection risk. So what about current research and prospects for the future? I think my take would be the better we understand where the immune system is going wrong, the better we can actually plan to use drugs and other treatments that are much more specific. The other thing we'd love to do, and I think this will also happen, is we use what we call individually tailored treatment or stratified treatment We'd like to be able to say to someone in front of us, I think the, the right drug for you is this, and I think your best chance of responding is with this. And the reason is because I've done this test, or we know that these people will respond best. At the moment, for example, with that anti-TNF therapy, basically doctors have tried it in a whole variety of diseases, not just rheumatoid arthritis. It's great for ankylosing spondylitis. It's great for Crohn's disease. They tried it for, for example, multiple sclerosis, and it was worse. It didn't work at all. And we don't really understand. At the moment, we're at the phase of trying most of our treatments for most of the diseases and hoping they work. I think in 10 years' time, we will really have a much better understanding of who should get what. So one of the things our research involves, and the people in the room who I know have given blood samples, is looking at those policemen and policewomen, the, the, neutrophil, the, the lymphocytes in people with different forms of arthritis and working out whether they're too activated, which types, which bits of them are switched on, which are switched off. And if we could go back and then look at what treatment that patient had or that person had and work out whether they responded, we might be able to predict better beforehand who was going to respond. <coughs> Of course, there are big implications. If we could get this better, we wouldn't be giving people treatments that didn't work. Also, as I've told you, TNF is an important um, cytokine. For example, it's important in our ability to fight off TB, tuberculosis. Now, mercifully, that's pretty rare in Oxfordshire, but it's in many parts of the world, it's a common infection. And certainly my father had it and grandparents had it. It used to be much commoner in this country. And we do realise that people who are receiving anti-TNF therapy are at risk of redeveloping or developing TB. They may have had it as a child and it's been dormant in their body, but when the TNF is taken out, it can start to come back. We'd really like to have treatments which are much more specific. And of course, the other thing we'd like to do is treat earlier. So I think individually tailored treatment is definitely starting to happen and it's on the cards. I think our treatments will get more specific and we'll have fewer side effects. We've already made a big move to treat people earlier because the, uh, we do know from a lot of very, very good research for diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, even 20, 25 years ago when I first started practicing, we tended to wait till it was really bad and then give people drugs. Now we realize the sooner you actually intervene, you can stop that vicious cycle developing. What we'd love to do is to be able to prevent disease altogether. And as I said, there are trials I'm aware of um, in, in Holland and other countries where they're actually starting to treat people even before they've developed it, if they think they've got a chance. At the moment, I think the drugs are a bit too risky to do that routinely. And then I've put the, the cure word at the bottom. Of course, the drug companies love drugs that you have to keep giving for year after year, but we'd much rather find one personally and talking to people that we could just give us a short, a short, sharp shock, as it were. If we could reset our immune systems, switch them off and then switch them back on again, that would be great. Yeah. So the Oxford Biomedical Research Centre, because they've set up this, is um, an NHS-funded... Um, um, research area and Oxford was one of a number of big university medical centres around the country that was successful in bidding to get funding for this and the research includes many themes but one of the themes is around immunity and inflammation 
And even within that theme, obviously, the, the money gets spread out fairly thinly. But within that theme, there are four areas of current research going on in Oxford. One is into inflammatory diseases, so obviously I'm the joints, but also skin disease, psoriasis, eczema, and also inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, a lot of interest in all those. These are really the autoimmune diseases. On the flip side, they're also researching into infection, HIV and hepatitis C. And as I alluded to, for those type of conditions, it may be by boosting the immune system we could eradicate these viruses. There's also a theme around how genetics controls our immune systems and how our immune systems develop. I mentioned this thymus gland. It's a huge gland when you're born because that's when your, your, your policemen and women are being educated. As you get older, it slowly gets smaller and smaller. And I guess there's another theme around immunomonitoring which is what I was talking about, about maybe being able to sort of measure how activated the immune system was. We don't really have any tests we can do to work out that. We sort of guess at the moment. So as I've said, the better our understanding, as we develop a better understanding of the immune system in a variety of diseases, and often research into one disease or even basic research leads to unexpected knowledge in another for example, as I mentioned, that tumor necrosis factor was first described in a mouse, and you can argue about the pros and cons of research in mice, but definitely having all the understanding from mouse research meant that the human research went much more quickly. And I think, um, as I've said, we've been really excited to be able to develop these biologic treatments for rheumatoid arthritis and related conditions. Um, they're all injections, and again, most people would rather take a tablet if they can, and I think those are starting to come out, new tablets that could do a similar job. But I wanted to add a note of caution that um, any new drug takes in the order of 10 years to develop, and it needs to be very extensively and carefully tested. Those later stages of testing cost tens, if not hundreds of millions of pounds, and obviously, that's where you absolutely rely on the pharmaceutical companies to provide the big funds for those. That's the model at the moment. There's certainly a big interest in Oxford to do a lot of the early research work and make it freely available because there is a feeling that um, it's better to decide whether a drug, many drugs start off looking promising and then are abandoned at a later stage because of side effects. And if we, there's a big move in Oxford to do a lot of the early research, make it freely available, and try and help the pharma companies to only develop drugs which are really likely to work. So there will be a huge number of new drugs coming out, but it's, a, it's, it's our guess as to whether all of them or only a few will come into circulation. But I think the next 10, 15 years, we will definitely see new medications, and some of them will be tablets instead of injections. So I will stop there and just thank uh, the BRC for funding some research. Um, obviously, also very good charities such as Arthritis Research, which has funded my work. Oh, here we go. This is <laughs> my research group, and these are some very cute dogs. Thank you. <laughs>